Okay, hi, um, I'm Dr. Yusha Nu. I'm co-founder of Veritas Education Leaders and co-founder of Branch Out, a youth mentorship program. We're here based in the Washington DC area. Um, today, we have this amazing panel on medicine, career panel on medicine. And what's even more, I guess, exciting is that we actually have people uh, registered from around the country and even around the world. We have people from 15 plus states. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, welcome. And we want you to, you to know that this is going to be an interactive panel where uh, please feel free to ask questions and sign up to our future panels. Uh, we have been doing this for, this is our second summer. Our last, last year we did six panels and we are gonna have more this year. Um, the goals, I guess the main goal of these panels is to help students and professionals, of course, learn more about these really interesting fields so that they can decide, right, if this is the right field for them and also learn more about, I guess, maybe some of the challenges, right? Because I'm sure each field um, has its own, um, I don't want to say struggles, but challenges for sure, right? But also, um, their memorable moments. And we hope that our presenters will be able to share uh, the highlights of their career with our team. So yeah, student leaders, go ahead. All right, thank you, Dr. Wu. So good evening, everyone. My name is Johnny Wu, and I'm with my partners, Sophia Lee, Jan Goyal, and Leila Ibrahim, and we are part of the Branch Out program. Branch Out is a nonprofit organization with Veritas Education Leaders, which was co-founded by Dr. Yushin Wu, whom you've already met, and Mr. Richard Wang in 2015, and grew from 20 student volunteers to over 100 student volunteers in four short summers. Our high school student mentors come from over 40 different schools across five states. We started out as a peer STEM mentoring program, working at community centers, homeless shelters, and county summer credit recovery programs and have since expanded into a community outreach program. Our goals are to promote cross-cultural understanding by featuring community heroes, creating research articles, and organizing these career panels. Part of Branch Out's goals to promote civic engagement, community, and STEM education, we are so excited to be presenting this very informative career panel. We chose to focus on the medical and medical research field for this career panel because it's very pertinent to the function of all humans and the introduction of a better, more efficient medical techniques that save lives. We're able to be where we are today with the improvement of medicine and healthcare. It is vital to understand the work of medical researchers and learn all about the important work that they're responsible for. As an evolving medical researcher, one needs critical thinking skills, effective communication, and the ability to make educated decisions. This panel will feature a number of experts in the medical and medical research fields, all of whom have been striving to better the lives of the public. Um, we're very honored to have you all here with us today. Before we introduce the speakers, it's so exciting to see that we have many people coming from 13 different states from all across the US. We are very thankful for your time and your willingness to learn more about medicine. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Talat. She is an associate professor of the International Health Department at the Center for Immunization Research. And Dr. Talat is also the co-director for clinical research at the Johns Hopkins Institute for Vaccine Safety. We're so glad to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Layla. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, as, as Layla mentioned, I, um, I'm at the Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm um, an infectious disease physician by training, and I do vaccine research. I also teach at the School of Public Health, and I see patients at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Talat. Our second speaker will be Dr. Ibrahim, and she is the medical director of Innova VIP 360 and a board certified family physician with 20 years of experience. Her dedication to her work can be seen in the relationship she builds with her patients, making them feel like family. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Dr. Ibrahim, could you please introduce yourself? 
Thank you, Sophia. Thanks for having me here tonight. And it's an honor to be here with Dr. Talat and Dr. Huang as well. So yeah, I've been in practice for over 20 years now. It hurts to say that, but that's a fact. <laughs> I've been in primary care. I'm a family physician and um, that's, that's most of what I do. And I have now taken a position as the medical director. So I oversee a team of 14 other primary care providers and we manage together all the patients in our panel. I work at Innova Health System, which is a not-for-profit health system here. It's the largest system in Northern Virginia. And it's my honor to be here today and hopefully inspire the next generation of uh, health scientists for sure. Yeah, wow, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. Our third speaker who will be joining us this evening is Dr. Huang. Dr. Huang is the current chair of genomic data science at Indiana University School of Medicine, professor and vice chair in biostatistics and health data science and the associate at Dean for Genomic Data Science. It's truly an honor to have you here today. Could you please introduce yourself? Um, thank you very much for your invitation. And it's a great honor to be here and uh, to discuss with uh, all the interested parties and in next generation researchers and, med and the clinicians. Um, I'm, as, as Johnny said, I'm right now in Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, unlike many other states, we are a small state with only one medical school. So um, our entire medical, actually our entire state has only one RPASI medical school. And uh, um, also we have one children's hospital. So that basically says it's actually make a lot of difference uh, when we are trying to work with the clinicians and trying to help them in making the decisions by using data science and promoting that. Just what I'd like to mention a little bit, my background is quite different. I'm not a, uh, I'm not an MD, so I, I don't practice medicine. I do focus on biomedical research. Uh, I'm actually an electrical engineer by training. And so uh, it just happens I find my, found my first job in medical school and stayed uh, in medical school since then 17 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Huang. We're thrilled to uh, have you all here with us this evening, and I'm sure you all will provide excellent information regarding the industry for us. We, were, we will start off by asking a set of questions. During this time, if anyone in the audience has any questions or thinks of any questions later on, you can type it in the chat to everyone and we'll get to them after our set of questions. Let's get started with our first question. <clears throat> our first question is, what prompted you to go into the medical field? specifically in your area of specialization today. Dr. Talat, would you like to go first? Um, sure, thank you very much. Um, so I, well, for as long as I can remember, I've loved science and I've loved biology and always been interested in medicine. And I think what, what prompted me um, to go into my, my area of, of uh, practice is, when I was in college, I took a global health course and I realized that what killed people in many parts of the world were infectious diseases and it killed people young, it killed children. Um, and the best way to prevent a disease or to prevent the sequela, the, the, what happens after somebody gets infected with a disease is to never have the disease happen. And the best way to do that is to give people vaccines. And, um, and so I've been very interested in vaccines. I've been working on vaccines for 14 years now. Um, and um, I think that they, they're they one of the major public health um, successes in terms of what we've done with um, vaccines against a lot of different diseases um, and even against COVID. Um, and so it's, um, it's a way to make a, a very large impact on a lot of people. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that's really cool. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, would you like to go next? Sure. I think ultimately when it comes to the health sciences, you have to have that sympathy and empathy and the want to help fellow man. So in one way or the other, whether it's through research or clinical practice, you're going to have to have that deeply embedded inside of your soul. You want to help others. And there's a number of ways to help others, but I obviously chose to do that in the medical setting you have to be curious. And I was always a very curious child. And thankfully, as an adult, that's turned out to be uh, uh, in my best interest. And then you have to have an inclination towards the sciences too. And I happen to be a microbiology major in my uh, bachelor's degree. Um, and then of course, when you wanna help others, there's so many facets to the field of medicine. And I chose primary care as a family physician. 
in primary care, much like what Dr. Talat said, is, it's, is you want to prevent diseases from happening in the first place. Obviously, in her instance, it's going to be through vaccination. And then through my instance, it's going to be more about counseling and prevention of heart disease with, you know, lifestyle modification, prevention of diabetes with uh, making sure you counsel against obesity and so forth and so on. And absolutely vaccines. I think that's going to be a common theme this evening is to discuss vaccines. So definitely curiosity, a love for the sciences, the want to help your fellow man. And again, in my instance, primary care for sure. Yeah, I, I guess it's my turn. Um, I, I, th I think for me, it's a little bit different. Frankly, when I was in high school or even college, I never thought I would go to medical field. Um, I started, my interest was really trying to understand how brain works. So back in undergraduate, I was a biology major, focused on neurobiology. When I was first doing first master degree, I was doing neurophysiology. Um, for some reason, Actually, I did my PhD in electrical engineering, which focused more on machine learning and computer vision. Um, but interestingly, by the time I was graduating, I was getting my PhD and I was looking for jobs. And uh, uh, one day I saw an advertisement, basically it said, uh, we are a new department in Ohio State University, biomedical informatics, uh, and we are looking for people who want to do, Im who can do image analysis, computer vision, uh, but hopefully with a biology background. Um, I look at it, I said, this sounds really fits me well. <laughs> so I submitted an application and then got an interview and then got an offer. So I started in medical school, frankly, knowing nothing about what I was getting into. Um, but then it became very challenging at first. Um, but really I started to really enjoy the part is what I found is what I learned, like you know, machine learning, AI, computer vision, can, direct, can have some really direct impact, which you know, not only just you invent an algorithm you hope other people can use, now everyone you work with actually has real high impact applications. Uh, some really on medical biomedical research on discovery, some potentially on directly on clinical decision-making. So that really intrigued me as, a, as my colleagues and I, we used to say it became addictive. So we, I decided to stay in the field. That's how I stayed there since then. Thank you all so much for sharing. I'm sure a lot of the audience members are also interested in sciences and the STEM field. So your experiences are very helpful to our audience members. Um, the next question for all of you is, what do you think is the most common misconception about the medical field? Dr. Talat, you can go first again. I think one of the things that, um, that Dr. Ibrahim said and, and, and Dr. Wong is that, it, it, that that we, there is no one path to medicine. I think that there are many, this is for us, um, there are many paths to medicine and, um, and there's, there's so much room for people who are curious and interested in science to work in the medical field in so many different aspects. Um, and so I, I see students who think that if they do A through Z, in exactly that order, they will get into medical school and they will be this kind of doctor. And, and, and I think that, um, that the, 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 that's probably what I think is the biggest misconception. And that if you are, you should follow your passion and do what you want to do. And if it ends up being in health sciences or in medicine, you will get there no matter what path you take. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop there. I get, if we're gonna go in order, I'll go next for sure. Um, hard to say what the misconceptions are because I don't know what the misconceptions are, but I can imagine that one of them might be that, you know, doctors are at the top of a totem pole and they're very cocky and untouchable. And I can say with conviction that every day I am humbled by medicine, I'm humbled by the human body, I'm humbled by how much I don't know and have yet to learn. It is a field that I don't know that anyone can truly master as we can see now with this COVID pandemic, we're learning as we go. Um, and science is in statistics and science and, and evidence-based medicine is imperative and um, it, it's very humbling. So if you, if you don't have that sense of, um, 
ability to be humbled, it may not be the best path for you. You have to be able to accept that the world is greater than we are and we are a part of it. And you, it's a constant learning. Uh, at least for me, I don't think one can ever master uh, something always challenging every day, take it home, learn some more, take it to the office the next day and continue to learn. So constant evolution. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Actually, those are the, really the two points I was trying to say. Uh, when we talk about different paths, when you want to go to medicine, exactly sometimes you think, okay, go do this, do this, do this. But if you look at like my colleagues, I mean, I used to have a, a very prominent colleague who was the president of American Cancer Researchers Association for Cancer Research. He actually was under trained as a historian. Um, and uh, uh, I used to have an MD PhD student in my lab and he was a math major. Even this summer, there was an MD student doing research with me. He was a computer science major. Um, and so it's really, at, at the same time, not only just the only as exactly Dr. Ibram, Ibrahim said, it's, there are so many things. So it's not just like you can only be MD to do research or you can only do certain major to do research. I mean, I have a whole bunch of students who are double E or computer science majors uh, and now actually working in medical school. And so as long as you're curious and you love to learn knowledge and learn to actually apply knowledge and discover new knowledge, this is something you can always find something for you. I mean, I even have a student who is a computer science PhD, got computer science PhD with us, so working in uh, biomedical application, did a postdoc in Harvard Medical School, and now is a VP in Fidelity. But he still, during his spare time, he still go to Harvard to do experiments. So he still keep publishing papers with the Nobel Prize Laureate Lab. So it's really just uh, like whatever you feel is uh, that intrigues you and go with your heart. Yep, thank you. That's super interesting. And I'm pretty sure our audience would appreciate all the advice you've given them. Uh, so as we all know, many different jobs have different work schedules, such as software developers might be spending a day at an office or athletes might be practicing at a training court or something. So could you tell us what a common day of your work is like? Um, so I think for me, it's really, I, I have very different kinds of days because of the different hats that I wear. Um, so there are days where I'm seeing patients in the hospital and then I'll have meetings or, or work on my research in the morning. And then I go to the hospital in the afternoon and in the evening um, and see patients and then come home and finish writing my notes. Um, most of the time I'm doing research and that can, and often that, that just involves a lot of computer work um, because it, you have to write proposals, you have to write protocols, you have to um, answer questions, have, there's a lot of meetings. Um, I'm doing vaccine clinical trials and so we have volunteers that come in. I have a staff that I work with um, very closely and we see our volunteers, we um, screen them, we enroll them, we vaccinate them. Um, and then I also teach. And so I spend a lot of time working with students as well and in the classroom. And so um, it depends on the day. I don't have a typical day. Most of my days are really different from one another, um, depending on sort of where I am in the cycle of everything, um, which is one of the things that I love about working in academics is I get to interact with a huge range of people um, and from students to patients to volunteers to other scientists all over the world. Um, and there's never an opportunity to you. Um, and I'm always learning. I, I, I never feel like, just like Dr. Ibrahim, I'm, I'm humbled by what I don't know. And, um, and I've always, I, I've, I learn every day something. Uh, days for me tend to be a little bit probably more routine than I think our other two guests because I am in uh, I am in clinical practice every day of the week. So a typical day and I hope everyone stays awake for this but I'll start off my day by logging in and reconciling labs and x rays and any kind of results that might have come in overnight and releasing those to the patients with a little um, 
discussion on, hey, work on your cholesterol. I'm not pleased about your insulin. Come in and see me. We need to work on this. So I just kind of get all the all the work out of the way. Then I start seeing patients in the morning from about nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. Patients that are previously scheduled for their annual exams, a lot of preventative medicine. And then obviously the folks that come in for the same day appointments, bee sting, back pain, sore throat, depression, anxiety, whatever it happens to be of the day. From 12 to one, I use that again for administrative time. So whatever labs might've come in in the morning, I'll go ahead and send those out to the patients. I might attend a conference. Uh, we have lunch times, um, lunch and learn series, we call them. So you can obtain some medical credits and learning. Same thing in the afternoon, some more patients and so forth. I tend to say for the end of my day, what I call the, um, the draining conversations when I have to call patients and tell them heaven forbid that they've got a cancerous finding on a lab or, hey, looks like blood work came back and it's not looking good. So those can be very emotionally draining. I don't like to start my days with those conversations. I tend to leave them for the end of the day because those can certainly run over and I wanna give the patient enough time to discuss um, and then from beginning till end, I probably come into the office around 8 a.m. and I'll leave around 5. And that's a typical clinic day for me. And then again, I, as a director, I have to manage other doctors, which is probably the hardest part of my job. It's easy to take care of the patients, but it's hard to take care of other doctors. So things from evaluations to coverage to call schedules and so forth. And we do take call after hours. And what that means is if any of our patients has a medical concern or question or need, they will call the on-call service and that rings to my cell phone. So we take call just about once a month and that, you know, so the day doesn't end at five for some of us. Some of us, it goes all the way through to the next day and then we hand off the call pager to the next person. So we're always a doctor, always a doctor, always a doctor, even on the weekends. And every once in a while, you can turn off your cell phone, but you know, you're going to log in within a couple of hours. So that's kind of a typical day for me. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, the thing is, uh, once you're in call, during the COVID period, in sort of my every day is on Zoom. So, but uh, um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the same time, I would say, um, actually a typical day for me, a lot of times is uh, on in meetings, uh, because right now, the, given, given what we are doing, we are doing data science in such ways that including the biomedical informatics, bioinformatics, and the biostatistics, um, which actually all team science, consider team sciences. By team science, it means when we, trying to carry out the research, it actually involves a lot of interdisciplinary partners. I mean, that including the clinicians, but that including a lot of other medical professionals, but including other scientists, students, and at the same time, engineers. We actually work a lot with the School of Engineering, School of Science. Um, so that means when we are doing those projects, there has to be a lot of coordinations. So like it or not, I have to do a lot of meetings. A lot of them are related to research projects, but some are all related to uh, administration because how do we reallocate resources to for certain uh, projects or certain specific programs or initiatives. Uh, also a lot of meetings are regarding mentoring. I'm right now mentoring, um, I'm the vice chair in the department. Also, I lead a program in data science. So actually I mentor about the seven junior faculty members. So I have regular meetings with them talking about the grant proposals, talking about research projects. Uh, then I meet with my students and postdocs and scientists in my research group talking about specific groups. Uh, so it ha I have to, unfortunately I have to say during daytime, most of the time uh, in the meetings. So my actual research time is yeah, during nights. So usually after nine o'clock, I start to work. <laughs> start to work on real research. Um, and that's including, you know, red papers. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, sometimes I feel, you know, uh, it's like, I feel really lucky if I can spend an hour to actually write codes. Um, but that is a luxury sometimes. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lot of coordination, a lot of meetings. Um, but at the same time, when you start to see the results coming out, become really excited. Thank you for all your answers. I personally like love to see how there's so many sides and aspects onto like every single one of what you guys do and how there's so much overlap between the different fields and like in the specialties you guys have. So like doing research or tending to patients, it so much goes into the medical field. So for something related to like advice, what would you guys, advice to young adults and students who are trying to pursue a career in the medicine or medical research field. So basically, do you guys have any advice? Um, 
my advice would be to follow your passion. And um, because it's so much easier to be successful if you're doing what you love. Um, the, my other advice would be to get exposure as early as you can. Um, I know it's really hard, especially during the pandemic to do this, but um, work in a lab. Uh, volunteer in a clinic or a hospital, um, you know, see what the, it's not, it's not always a glamorous field. And, and um, there's a lot that is repetitive. There's a lot that is emotionally draining, as Dr. Ibrahim said, there's a lot that is a lot of meetings, as Dr. Wong said. And so it's good to have exposure to that and decide what it what it is that drives you and what it is you want to do and find people to find a good mentor or mentors who can help you along the way. Yeah, that's that's about everything, Dr. Talat, really. Um, you know, a lot of folks ask me if I had to do over again what I do at knowing what I know now, and I absolutely would. But what I might regret is that, well, it's not really a regret. Let me say this. The field of medicine has changed so much. I graduated 21 years ago. Again, that hurts to say that. There are fields in medicine now that did not even exist when I was looking at my residencies. I mean, interventional radiology was nothing we talked about 21 years ago. The concept of an MD, JD, just getting those two degrees, I didn't know anything about that. MD, MBA, I didn't know anything about that. So there's, we even have physician assistants and nurse practitioners now, that didn't exist 21 years ago. So you have to be committed to the field. I think we, I, we call them health sciences. Is that what you want to do in terms of promoting health and well-being? And then what do you want to do in that field? Do you want to be on the engineering side? Do you want to develop in the next MRI machine? Do you want to go into technology and start talking about wearables like your EKG on your Apple Watch? Do you want to go into um, the actual practice and delivery of healthcare? Do you want a hospital setting, a clinic setting? So there's so much within the health sciences research, obviously, that you kind of have to be committed and then know that you have the freedom wherever, whatever you do decide to do to move within the health sciences. There's telemedicine now. I mean, I didn't even have a cell phone when I graduated from medical school, but now we can do medicine via the Zoom screen, which is outrageous and bill for it in insurances and all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's important to, to have the passion first and foremost, because it is a long, long journey. And there's a lot of debt by the time you come out of it. And if you're going in it for the, for the money, if you're going in it for the prestige, there are other things you can do for money and prestige. You have to have the passion for it. Otherwise, it's a really long slog. I didn't get my first paycheck until I was 30. Think about that. Um, yeah, so I think that's in, that's a really, you know, I, I think the first two speakers really, really spot on. Um, what I feel is, since this is so, this field is, I mean, it's not really one field, but it's just such a vast um, amount of area. And uh, it, it's evolving so fast that we just have to be brave. And basically to say, I'm trained, I, I have, I'm a professional with training, with knowledge to learn. And you just have to be humble that you can learn new things every day. Um, and at the same time, to understand what, at the same time, don't get lost because you, once you, you, you're in medical school, you, you know you're good at something. And uh, uh, at the same, even though you don't know everything. <laughs> uh, so you acknowledge you don't know everything and you know what you're good at. And then you work with people. That's. Uh, um, that that's one thing. Another thing I think, as also as Dr. Talad mentioned, uh, getting a mentor. It's a, uh, I, frankly, before, <laughs> be, it, it took me a long time to realize that, and then now I really see the value for that. Even four years ago, I was recruited to Indiana University as assistant dean. And when the dean asked me, say, what do you need? I said, I need a mentor. <laughs> and because this is not a job I have done before and uh, someone can consult will, will help a lot. So I basically see that as a mentor is something we need almost like during the entire career. Uh, same thing, I didn't get a, I got my first real paycheck, not as a student stipend, but first a paycheck when I was 30. So be prepared. 
Thank you so much for sharing your advice. I'm sure a lot of high schoolers, including me, don't really know exactly what we want to do when we get older. So we'll definitely take all those things into account. Um, the next question for you is, what is something that you most enjoy and something that you least enjoy about your job today? I, I think I have it easy by going first every time. I love the diversity of things that I do. I love the people that I work with, both my students, um, my team, my colleagues, my collaborators all over the world. Um, I love that I get to learn um, constantly. Um, and I love that I can help people. Um, I don't really like the fact that I am always behind. And no matter how much I work, if I work all the time, if I do all-nighters once a week, um, I'm always, always behind. There are people that I owe things to um, that are wanting what I need to give them and I don't have time to do it. And so that I think is the downside to, um, I think anybody in academics or anybody in research, um, I'm never gonna catch up. Um, but um, it definitely is a, um, I, I, it, I'm also really tired of Zoom meetings, but not this one, this one's fantastic. Um, but it definitely is something that the far, like the benefits of what I do and the joy in what I do far outweigh that. So. Uh, for me, I, what I enjoy most about my career choice is that I can see results. I, I institute an algorithmical plan based on science and evidence-based medicine and uh, the fruits of everybody else's labor. I use that information, I implement that information, all with the hopes that the patient is compliant with that information, and then I see results. So if there's a satisfaction for somebody like me who likes to see an action and a reaction. So that's, that's satisfying. Without a doubt, the hardest part of my job is delivering bad news. And as a primary care provider, oftentimes we're the first to deliver. So when somebody gets to the oncologist, they already know they have cancer. Somebody had to deliver that news. When somebody gets to the surgeon's office, they already know that their gallbladder has to come out. I already gave that news. So for a lot of these folks, I'm the deliverer of bad news, but I'm also the one that they trust because we've built such a long relationship together that if anyone's going to give them that kind of news, they want it to come from somebody that they trust. So being able to instill trust with complete strangers and building that bond and knowing that they have a safe space with me to tell me their deepest, darkest concerns and worries and medical problems and being able to provide them with, to the best of my ability, some sort of solution. So it's a, it's a tough job for sure. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to me, actually, if you take that as a, the actions, what I enjoy most and, uh, and enjoy least is the same thing, meetings. Uh, I have so many meetings, but uh, some of the meetings exactly where we meet our collaborators, we discuss data, we discuss a problem, and meet with the students and see their progress and uh, getting new results. And especially sometimes, you know, we have an idea and student told me, okay, it actually works. Right? So that's really, really enjoyable. And we see their growth and uh, that's a part. I mean, like I have two, two PhD students just defended the last month and uh, now they are leaving for their new jobs. One of them going to Stanford to do postdoc, one of them going to Facebook actually. Um, so th those are part I really, really enjoy. Um, the least enjoy part is sometimes, you know, some meetings become not very pleasant once you start talking about, uh, um, you know, trying to figure out really why some certain things doesn't work or uh, why the way we distributed resources was not ideal. And uh, occasionally like some fund got wasted and those kind of things, um, unfortunately they can drag for a long time and many meetings, um, but it's just a part like, you know, sometimes your car breaks down and you have to fix it. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing. That was really interesting. Um, the next question is, what was the most difficult part of your job during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially for those of you working actively as doctors? 
Um, so I was working actively as a doctor and I think seeing patients with COVID um, was really hard. Um, I, I um, you know, saw a lot of people who, because I, I do, I practice in the hospital, not in the clinic. And so I saw a lot of people who were sick in the hospital. I saw people who were in the ICU on ventilators. Um, I saw people not make it. Um, and I think, you know, as doctors, we see that a lot um, and it's always hard. I think the thing about COVID that made it even harder is that they were alone because they couldn't have their families. Their families couldn't be in there with them to say goodbye. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was in the clinic, obviously, not in the hospital setting, which was a very challenging year trying. And I, my actual office happens to be in the cancer center. So we had to take the utmost precautions to protect our cancer patients from our own patients that might be coming in for coughs and colds and so forth. So the logistical challenges were, were far and wide. Um, but frankly, the most difficult part for me personally during the pandemic was the politi pol politization of an infectious disease. And that does not mesh with evidence-based medicine. My entire life is evidence-based medicine, science, books, truth, and to have the intersection of politics and mistruths come in makes it makes my job harder to, I'm not trying to convince people to take vaccines or convince people to wear masks, but all of a sudden there were these barriers that would have never existed in any other time, I think, in humanity. So that was really, really difficult to swallow personally and professionally. We survived clearly, but that was a challenge that I hope to never go through again. And I still have a good subset of patients who refuse the vaccine for one reason or the other and are just really petty about the masks. And I won't get into politics here either, but that was a, that was a challenge that I had not anticipated because COVID was bad enough. Actually, I'm going to jump in and completely agree with Dr. Ibrahim because the, this pandemic is so much worse than it needed to have been because of the politics. Agreed. I mean, I, I, I don't see patients, so um, that may be slightly easier for me, but I just to say it essentially added meetings and meetings than what I used to hope for. Uh, actually, for me, the most of, some of the most difficult part is uh, during this process, a lot of people left. And uh, I mean, they, they move back to their own country, they move on with new jobs. Um, just because of all the restrictions, we couldn't even see them off, which sometimes made me very sad. Um, that's really the part that I miss the most, I would say. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Like some things that Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, such as politics, and people not wearing masks or about the vaccine is something that I haven't even thought about. We're gonna do one more question before we move on to audience questions. And that is, what do you think the future of the medical and medical research field is gonna be like? Um, so I'll, I'll leave the clinical medicine to Dr. Brahim um, to answer it, I, I, just from a, from a public health and, and um, vaccine science standpoint, um, I think that there has been more interest in vaccines and more interest in medical research and more investment, especially, um, especially in the last year. Um, and so I think that um, there, there will be hopefully more trust in public health, although we are still incredibly divided um, as a country. Uh, but I think that bodes well for the future. Uh, there's multiple things I can add to this as a clinician. So 
in my own short, long career, we've seen the advent of the internet where the patient already knows their disease and diagnosis before they come to the doctor, which is annoying and helpful in some instances. We've seen the advent of wearables. Again, folks have their own uh, glucose monitors attached to their arms so they can keep a good database for us. They've got their EKGs and they've got their blood pressure logs and they can share that with us. So telemedicine has become really strong. And then we've got um, the advent of what we call personalized medicine where, you know, in years, and this is where the research comes in, in years past where a chemotherapy would be given for a cancer and it would work 10% of the time, turns out that chemotherapy would work 100% of the time in 10% of the people. So it has to be targeted to those that person's genetics and their certain enzymes in their liver and just how they process the chemo. So we are starting to personalize cancer therapeutics. So if said person has said cancer of this said variety, we give them this said chemotherapy and we can knock it out, you know, 98 to 100% of the time. So very targeted, personalized medicine. And we've starting to see that a lot in the cancer uh, field of cancer research. And that's very exciting where we can help more people without the toxicity of all the medicines that we used to do in years past. So there's a lot, a lot of technology and cancer research and genetics. We're using genetics now to help people, stem cell research, all kinds of things. So it's very exciting and which means lifelong learning. So that's it's a challenge for everybody. Yeah, to me, I, I mean, I interact a lot, I think also on the basic science side. Um, but if you think about actually what Dr. Uh, Ibrahim just said, I mean, the personalized medicine and or precision medicine, whichever way we call it, um, it's going to be a lot more data-driven than it used to be. And there's a huge amount of data being generated. So I think in the past, maybe there were more facts, there's more knowledge. Uh, and now besides those facts and knowledge, and there are going to be a lot of data-driven data part. Uh, those data could be at, you know, molecular level, like genomics data, genetic variants, could be images, radiology images, histopathology images, and those, but could be clinical records and public health information, right? So geographical information, essentially you're going to see a huge variety of data that been playing key roles in uh, biomedical research, but possibly also in medicine, medical decisions. Thank you, Dr. Huang, Dr. Ibrahim, and Dr. Tala. Uh, I'm sure that from my personal experience and definitely what the audience probably thinks too, is that like with technology and with medicine ever evolving, the future of medicine is unknown, but also there's so much to be seen. So I personally can't wait to maybe go into this field myself and hopefully have audience members also be interested. So at this point, if anyone has questions or clarifications for our panelists, feel free to keep typing them in chat or direct message any one of us. And then the first question from the audience we have is, what kind of personality or characteristics do you think is best suited for a person to be a doctor or something or a researcher, whatever pertains to your field. I can, I can share, if you're gonna go into clinical medicine where you're interfacing with the public, you have to have communication skills. It's not good enough to know everything that's in the book. Uh, and you have to be able to deliver information effectively. You have to be able to absorb information effectively. So communication is absolutely essential. You have to be humble. You have to be humble and you have to treat the patient in the lab. You have to be humble. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I think the, I mean, we, we see all kinds of personalities uh, in our, in our uh, collaboration. I have, I have a collaborator who used to be a paratrooper from Division 101. So, I mean, you can see a very different personality, but he's a great guy to, very fun guy to talk with after beers. Uh, so that, but at the same time, I think it's really the communication and that communication could be our communication uh, when you are working with on team science projects, but it could be a lot of time we do writing. I mean, think about what we do, we write papers, we write grant proposals, we write reports, we write evaluation, we write reference letters. Um, and the later you go into your career and the more writing you are going to do. So writing skills will be something very critical. 
I completely agree with that. Lots and lots of communication with at all levels with everybody is really important, but also um, you have to be curious and you have to have um, empathy. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure a lot of people, I didn't know about those skills that were needed to be a doctor. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, the next question from the chat is, if any of you majored in public health or studied public health in college, what types of career paths could you go on to after college? If any of you know. So I was a zoology major in college, but I teach at School of Public Health, so I put in an answer in the chat. Um, there are so many fields open to public health majors that have nothing to do with medicine. You could work in a school, you could work in a health department, you could um, work in research, in a lab, in academics, in government, in um, state and local health departments, you could work in... Um, so many fields. I think, you know, the, the higher the degree that you have, the more authority and more responsibility you'll have. But even with a bachelor's degree in public health, there's many, many opportunities. Yeah, I think public policy is something um, we could use more advocacy in when it comes to the health sciences. So the more folks in public policy that have a background in the health sciences, I think the better we'll all be. I think, I think also one thing you'll learn from public health is uh, partially is exactly as a policy side at the same time is to give you a mentality of uh, think about data-driven research and being driven by facts and evidence and looking from a global angle. So that regardless which career paths you choose and that will always benefit. It's very um, valuable advice for the audience. Um, the next question from the audience is, what do you think of the BSMD program? What are the pros and cons and what type of students do you think this program is for? I'm not sure I'm familiar. I have a BS and an MD. I don't know if that's like maybe a, is that a truncated program where you do it in less than eight years, perhaps? Um, I think it's the combined Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Medicine degree program. So like maybe it's combined. I'm not too familiar with this either. Yeah, it might be something where instead of eight years, you truncate it into seven. That would be probably, I would think a personal preference. I would probably not advise it for one reason. And that would be go have fun in college, go learn about French history, go learn about architecture, go learn about engineering. One of my doctors is a chemical engineer, bachelor's degree. She has a master's in public health. And oh, by the way, she got a degree in medicine. Um, we've got, it, it, there's so much more to medicine than science, science, science. And my understanding, I think with those truncated programs where you hammer it all out in seven years is it's all science. You kind of cut out all the other stuff, but the other stuff is what makes you the person um, the well-rounded person, as we say, that can carry a conversation and be creative and curious and just learn from others around the world. So I personally wouldn't advise it, but of course that's personal preference. And I guess you save a year's worth of tuition too. I actually completely agree with Dr. Ibrahim. Um, my, my boss is a history major and, um, who's a physician. Her husband is an English major. Um, I, you know, explore the world. Again, I, I said, don't think of medicine as a path that you have to hit A, B, C, A through Z. Like explore the world, find your own path and don't, um, and, and grow up because you need to have a little bit of maturity to be a good doctor. And if you're 24, when you graduate from residency, you're not probably mature enough. Or from medical school, sorry, you're probably not mature enough. I, I especially agree with a part of not knowing what to do. I mean, I, I changed, I had a six majors. So I started with biology and later computer science and starting in physiology and did transfer to electrical engineering, wandered off to mathematics. I mean, frankly, it was just really enjoyable to me. Um, and finally, I ended up in medicine I really enjoy. Um, so it's, it's really like, are you ready? I mean, I think if you feel you're mature enough, you're very motivated, very driven and, Sure, I mean, this could be a great program. Uh, at the same time, there, there may be in the knowing that you may miss out certain things uh, that later you, I mean, there may be other things you need, you can think of how to compensate for it. So uh, I think there are pros and cons for that. But uh, one thing is I really want to make sure is don't think about just limiting yourself um, 
to a specific thing because later life will always find you will always find in life that something you hate most might be the thing you're actually doing so yeah thanks so much for that and i really like how you mentioned how medicine is not just about science and the advice you gave on college and stuff was all very important and maybe all of us should take that into consideration um, the next question in chat, I noticed uh, Dr. Talat was answering a lot of them, and big thanks to her for doing that. But the next question is, is the COVID-19 Delta variant going to be a big problem or a threat to the public health? We already see it's a big problem and threat to public health, especially in areas that aren't well back highly vaccinated. And so the best way to protect ourselves against the Delta variant and all the variants to come is to get vaccinated and to make sure that people in our communities are vaccinated as well. Um, and we don't just want to vaccinate um, the US, but we want to vaccinate the world because anywhere where COVID can um, infect people and replicate, it can create new variants. So yes, it is a huge threat. Get a vaccine. I, I concur. I mean, I see it in the clinic for sure. Um, and maybe Dr. Talat can add to that. I think while we are aiming to get, you know, 70% of our country vaccinated at the end of the day, I think only 10% of earth is vaccinated. So we, it, this is far from over. I mean, I, I'm not a medical doctor, I cannot give medical advice, but I think generally just to treat this as, you know, a, as a serious pandemic and, uh, you know, continue to practice the best practice as advised. Wait, well, I didn't really know that only 10% of the world was vaccinated. That's a really strong thing. Yeah, that's yeah, a really... you want to fact check me on that. I, I may not be up to my Googles, but it's it's nowhere near America. America, yeah. I think, is one of the best, but that's we are true. but we have a long way to go. Yeah, that's really surprising to me. Um, so if anyone else had any questions, feel free to type them in chat still. Uh, but I'll ask another question. So relating back to high school, which I feel like many of our audience members are currently in, and college students, how has post high school education affected your career? And could you tell us a little bit more about your experience? I, I went to school, I'm a little older than Dr. Ibrahim. Um, so I, I went to school in the um, early 90s and environmental science was just becoming a thing. Um, global warming was just, we were just starting to understand it. And I took a lot of environmental science classes um, and a lot of ecology classes. I One of my favorite classes was about sea slugs. Um, uh, and I think that has really affected the way that I see the world. Um, and it, and again, goes to the don't limit yourself when you are in college because there's a huge world to explore. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to add, if if anyone's looking at going into clinical medicine, um, you know, go to a university that is wide and varied in their offerings. Um, you know, college of of arts and sciences and literature, not just, not just pigeonhole yourself into the sciences. When, when you get to medical school, if that's what your choice is, depending on what you wanna do, if you wanna be a researcher, I think if you wanna go into ophthalmology or dermatology, which are really competitive fields, yeah, it kind of matters what med school you go to. Yeah, it kind of matters what residency you go to because there's very few slots and they do tend to be at these bigger, cities and, and, and harder to get into. If you wanna go into primary care, which is what everybody on this screen should be wanting to do. If you wanna to go to primary care, take the path of least resistance, get your bachelor's degree in what you want to study. You will get into a medical school so long as you do well in school. You don't, ha I mean, it's the cream of the crop and then the cream of the crop here and then the cream of the crop here. If you've proven yourself to be a a good student and academically inclined and interested in the sciences, there's a med school for you somewhere. And, you, and if you wanna go into primary care, you don't have to go to Harvard for that. You don't have to go to Yale for that. 
you can become a primary care physician at, with all due respect, to in Utah or in Detroit, like I went to, or some smaller medical school, you're going to get there. The question is, do you want to get there? Is that what you really want? So you don't have to, I guess what I'm saying is don't break your neck, don't break your back trying to go to Harvard, 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 Harvard. You're going to get to where you want to get to. But in those really competitive fields, if you've already committed to going to something like being a, there's no world renowned family doctor, there really isn't, but there might be world renowned ophthalmologist, like the one guy that you go to at, at Johns Hopkins or the one cardiothoracic surgeon that you go to for certain things at the Cleveland Clinic. Outside of that, you're going to get there. You're, if you're a good student, you're going to get there. If your passion is there, you're going to get there because you have to be well-rounded on your medical school interview. It's not just about your grades. There's an interview. And if they see this student in front of them, it's not really in it because they want to be just because they think they have to be. It's not the right field for you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think, I think the post high school education, uh, especially the college part. That's, that is where really you start to find, you start to explore what you may want. <laughs> and at the same time, build your skills. So on one hand, I think really have a very solid education on key skills that, you know, regardless it's writing, it's quantitative skills, programming, whatever. At the same time, explore. I mean, be curious, so stay curious. Actually, I remember the reason I chose neurobiology was I always was just a, curious about how brain works, why we know we are ourselves, so things like those, but never know there is a field. And uh, so one day I was skipping class, I wandered off into a seminar and heard this word of cognitive science. Just so wow, there is actually a real thing to studying that. So I started to explore and uh, uh, then find the neurobiology as uh, what I'm interested in then starting learning and the later machine learning. So, I mean, those are the things you, those, you, you need a large environment to have that serendipity. Thank you guys so much for your advice. I know a lot of us are currently thinking about the future and what to do in college. So it's really helpful to hear from current professionals about what we might need to do. Um, and also thank you for answering all the audience questions. Yes. Yeah, One more thing. I just want to say that echo what Dr. Wong said because that was perfect way to end is serendipity. Keep your eyes open, keep your mind open. There might be something that you come across that you had never even heard of and never even considered, but you fall in love with. So be open to serendipity. Yeah, thanks uh, for all of that. If any of the speakers wanna add on to like any last remarks or any last pieces of advice, feel free to give that note. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have offline if you wanna email Layla and then I can get those, uh, those answers to you, of course. I can too. Yeah, I think we can put, we can, you can send us, we'll, I'll, we'll put our, the branch out email in chat and then you guys can send it to the branch out email and we can send it to prospective pr people depending on who has what question. Yeah, I guess, Um, thank you so much for, yeah. The, um, We would like to thank you again for all of that. And on that note, that would be all the time we have for tonight. Uh, I, I bet we all learned a lot from you guys and about the medical field and all the advice you've given us. On behalf of the whole Branch Out Career Panel team, we hope that everybody has enjoyed the panel this evening and learned a lot about the successful individuals in the medical field. We hope that everyone got a chance to experience the essence of the field, had their questions answered, and maybe even be inspired to pursue or learn more about the industry. The medical field has been a vital part of our daily lives and will continue to be for generations to come. We also are extremely appreciative of each and every one of the panelists, Dr. Talat, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Huang, for their time and giving us such great insight into this field. Um, we're also very appreciative of our audience members for making this panel so great and asking some wonderful questions. Finally, we would like to thank our other group members, Helen Chang, Rosalind Fang, Ella Zhao and Elizabeth Goh, who weren't able to speak today, and our project directors and Dr. Wu, of course. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you. And to wrap it all up, to learn more about Branch Owl and our future career panels, please check us out at www.velbranchout.org slash career panel. We'll put every, all the links into the chat. 
and like us on Facebook. Uh, our next two career panels will be on computer science and forensic science. So fill out the form if you would like to receive an email with more details about them. And we hope to see you there. Good night, everyone. Yep. Thanks again to all our speakers, Dr. Huang, Dr. Ibrahim, and Dr. Tala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Bye.